Good evening, and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to have, to have you here with us this evening. And a special welcome to those who, who are joining us on our YouTube channel. Our partner for tonight's program is the U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress, who we love to have here, and we thank them for their support. Before we begin tonight's program, I'd like to tell you about two programs that will take place in this space later this month. On Wednesday, March 8th at noon, author Scott Miller will re recount the work of Alan Dulles, as described in his new book, Agent 110, An American Spymaster and the German Resistance in World War II. The next week, on Thursday, March 16th at 7, we'll host the U.S. launch of Damien Shields' new book, The Forgotten Irish, Irish Immigrant Experiences in America, for which he researched Civil War pension files here at the National Archives to tell the stories of 35 Irish families. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events. There are copies in the lobby and also a sign-up sheet where you can receive it by regular mail or email. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The Foundation supports our, all of our education and outreach activities. Upstairs in a side gallery near the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, is a special display on the credentials of Jeanette Rankin in honor of the 100th anniversary of her swearing in as the first Congresswoman. Rankin was part of a long line of women like Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Victoria Woodhull, and Belva Lockwood who pushed for a greater say in governance of our country. Elected four years before women had the right to vote nationally, Rankin was sworn in on April 2, 1917. That same evening, President Woodrow Wilson appeared before Congress to ask for a declaration of war against Germany. Congresswoman Rankin joined 49 congressmen in voting against entering the war. Nearly 25 years later, Rankin made history again when in her second term in Congress, she voted against U.S. entry into World War II, just, before, just after the Pearl Harbor attack. Upholding her pacifist be beliefs, she was the only member of Congress to vote against the declarations of, of both world wars. After Jeanette, Jeanette Rankin, more women entered Congress, and each wave showed the next wave, wave for the next. Tonight, you'll hear from several women who pursued careers in public service and met and overcame challenges along the way. And now it's my pleasure to welcome our panelists to the stage. Our moderator is Rebecca Berg, who is national political reporter for Real Clear Politics. And our panelists are Anne Marie Burkle, a former member of Congress who represented New York and is now the acting chairman of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Barbara Kennelly is a former member of Congress who represented Connecticut and is president of her own advocacy organization, Barbara Kennelly Associates. Margot Matura, chief of staff to Congressman Claudia Tenney. And Laura Schenk, a mem former member of Congress who represented California and who serves on the board of directors of Biogen and Sempra Energy. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the panel to the stage. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm Rebecca Berg. I'll be your moderator tonight. Um, for these fabulous panelists, I'm so happy that we could have this group with us this evening. We have three former members of Congress, a current chief of staff, all of whom happen to be women, but even if they weren't, would be very, very accomplished and have some um, interesting, uh, amazing stories to tell us tonight about their experiences working in politics and government. I'm so excited to get started. And so um, I guess we can get started with uh, sort of the elephant in the room. We just came off of a historic, contentious election. You all might have seen some of it. <laughs> <laughs> and we had, of course, the first woman candidate for president. And so I'd like to just go down the line, if we could, um, and get your takeaways from this election. What surprised you about the first woman candidate for president and her campaign and how that went? 
um, what didn't surprise you, what you expected, um, and where do you think things go from here? What has this changed, if anything? So we'll start with you, Emma. So I think um, this election really was unlike no other election and on so many fronts, but we'll just talk about Hillary Clinton and her campaign. And um, I think, unfortunately, her timing wasn't right. This was a year when the American people were moving away from establishment politics and saying we want something different to happen in Washington. And I don't even know if they were sure, but they wanted to break out of the status quo. And so I think they perceived Hillary Clinton and the Clinton, um, the campaign and her and, and her husband being a president is part of that status quo. And I think that didn't work well for her. I don't know so much the woman. I, I think the American people are ready to have a female president. I think her bigger obstacle was the fact this was, election was just about we don't want the status quo, we want something different. I mean, they rejected 16 pretty status quo Republican candidates throughout the, the primary process, and uh, we ended up with someone who never we never thought was going to be president of the United States. So I think it was less about gender, probably more about the times, as well as um, the fact that this just was unlike any other election. I don't know how else to describe was it. Was that refreshing for you at all, or surprising that it, in your mind at least, wasn't about gender for the first female candidate for president? Um, yes, I think I'm hopeful that the women's movement is moving beyond that, that we are discriminated against or we don't feel that we have the same opportunities because we are women. I, I hope we're moving beyond that and having that kind of security and, and sense that society in general is, is, has gone past that. I mean, I, I look at myself, and we can get into that in a little bit, personal stories why, you know, at age 40, I get the opportunity to go to law school with six kids. That, to me, is there's been a change just from when I graduated in high school. That, that's a very different paradigm and a very different model. So I do think it was less about gender and more about the fact that this was just a remarkable election. Barbara, you came into Congress a few years before Anne Marie. Um, yes. and Quite a few. <laughs> at a time when it was, I would argue, much more difficult for any woman to get elected to any office. So, what was your takeaway from this election? Well, I'll be very frank with you. What you just said is it's quite hard now for a woman uh, to get elected uh, to higher office. The numbers are paltry, they're, they're very, very, they're still very low. Uh, we haven't broke that barrier in the Congress of 20% in the House. Uh, which is, is stunning. It, it really is. No, uh, how I felt, uh, I think still, uh, being a woman has a, you'd hear so often, I don't like her. And I don't like this the way she looks, or that the way she looks. Uh, they don't do, don't think what a man looks like. You, re you really don't. And uh, there's no doubt uh, what was just said, that uh, she had been around a long time, and there was a lot of things that uh, were... Uh, she was carrying her husband as well as she was carrying herself. But uh, I, I have to say to you, this was a very unusual election. And every day it gets more unusual when you think the uh, candidate, uh, uh, the person that is going to be our attorney general, has to say, oh, I can't be in, involved in any of because of the Russian situation. There are going to be more books written about that whole Russian situation. And I don't know if we'll ever find out exactly what happened. But uh, I, I think, and anyone sitting here thinks, of course we're ready for a woman president. But I'm afraid an awful lot of other people don't think that. They think 54% uh, uh, of white women uh, voted for Mr. Trump. And I agree with you that it was times were hard, and uh, that whole idea of the white man without a college education, he was very, very uh, disappointed in what was happening. And he, I don't think a lot of people uh, even the campaign understood how upset he was. But uh, I, I really want, didn't want to die before I saw a woman president, but I'm afraid it's going to happen. Wow. You're still kicking. So <laughs> don't give up the it isn't going to be the next time. <laughs> Margot, you work for a Republican, have worked for Republicans. So you have, I would imagine, a slightly different perspective on maybe the women who did vote for Donald Trump. But um, what, was, what was your takeaway from this election? Were you surprised? It was, first, very positive. Hillary Clinton was the nominee. We had a woman. That's really just a wonderful place to start. 
It was also a little disappointing as a woman, the number of people who asked me, well, you have to vote for Hillary. She's a woman. You're a woman. How could you possibly vote for Trump? I was like, wait, when did this become about Hillary being a woman? And then there's also now almost this undertone of Hillary being the nominee because she's a woman, a woman being the nominee for anything because she's a woman. Um, I've had people look at me and say, you have your job because you're a woman. I'm like, where did this come from? I've never felt that before. And that's become a little bit of a theme that I find very troubling. So it is great news. It's wonderful. There's now a someone that young girls can look at and they can say, I can do that. And I do think we will have a woman president. But it's also a little alarming. In some ways, it's almost like we've pushed back a little bit. Hmm. Lynn, do you see that? Well, the surprise was that she lost. That yeah, was right. <laughs> surprising yeah. to me. I'm from California, so it's the California bubble. And uh, you know, when you add up uh, her uh, margin, uh, a lot of it came from California. So living in that bubble, yeah, I, I was not only surprised, probably shocked. But uh, I, I agree uh, with what Anne Marie was saying in terms of the mood of the country. But it's, it's in addition to that, uh, there definitely was a feel about this being a woman and a woman that uh, was not soft and cuddly. You know, she is not, uh, she didn't come across as mom or grandmother, even though she's both. Uh, she came across with knowing her history and the 30 plus years of things that have been heaped on her. Uh, she is understandably cautious. Uh, so that came across in a different way to people that she's secretive. Uh, some of the things that happened with uh, Benghazi and the emails, uh, that all added up to uh, a, a combination of feeling uh, that the, it's, it's the economy uh, and she's not speaking to it. it. It definitely, the fact that she was not the right kind of woman that a man could, could vote for. And so uh, the confluence of all of that was the result. But um, I am hopeful that, at least in your lifetime and your lifetime, there will be a woman president. Uh, I, I will say, and I know this is heresy to my party, I always felt that the first woman president will be a Republican woman. Now, why I feel that way, I don't probe too much, but I, <laughs> I, I always uh, felt that way. But uh, Democrat or Republican, I think there will be a woman now because Hillary Clinton just blazed that trail in a, under very, very difficult circumstances. So a few of you raised this issue of Clinton's personality and how that factored into her campaign, especially as a woman. She's too tough, not tough enough. She's too soft. She, um, Donald Trump liked to use the word stamina. She doesn't have the stamina to uh, negotiate trade deals and that sort of thing. The three of you who have run and won elected office, run for and won elected office on this stage, I would be curious to hear from you all how you thought about some of these issues when you were running, or did you think about these issues when you were running? Were you worried about, as a woman, not seeming tough enough or seeming too tough? Um, were you worried that people would be looking too much at your personality and not enough at the policies that you're talking about? What were, what were the thoughts going through your mind when you started your first campaign? Well, <clears throat> I think that um, that issue that you're raising kind of transcends politics in general. So sometimes if a man is, you know, he's, he's firm, he's clear, he's, he's just in control and he's great. And if a woman takes a similar approach, it's like, oh, she's a bitch, you know? So there's, that has nothing to do with politics so much as it has to do with how we perceive differences in gender on that level. Mm -hmm. and. So I think that was part of the problem. Um, personally, I can remember, so I, um, way back when I was young, um, <laughs> um, I was appointed by the then mayor to be on the city council. And I will never forget it. One of the establishment Republican guys who was in the party 
invited me to breakfast, and he said to me, I'm just going to tell you, you need to, I used to wore my hair pulled back a lot. I had six little kids. I was in law school, and I'm on the city council. I was like, I don't have time. He said to me, you really, <laughs> you really need to wear your hair down more, and you got to smile more. So that was 20 years ago. I think we've moved from there, and I think that's good. But, you know, there is sort of that, that perception issue. I think, you know, women just generally are more, I won't say more conscious, but we are of how we look, and we pay more attention to those things. So I don't know if that's part of the, part of the issue. That's just, you know, so. But I didn't think about it when I was running for Congress. I, I'm just going to run, give the voters in my district a choice, because no one else was going to run against the incumbent. And that's what I did, and, you know, it worked out all right. <laughs> Clearly did. Barbara, you mentioned that you have in Congress now women comprising less than 20% of the lawmakers there. Um, and I wonder when you first ran for Congress, it was even less than that, I, mean, I would imagine. I think I was number 22. You were number 22, <laughs> there you go. Did you have any doubts about running? Were, did you have any worries about what challenges you would face on the campaign trail and in government as a woman? Well, not really, because I did it the way when I, I'm a teacher, by the way, and I teach women in, in politics. <laughs> and uh, I, I think um, I was confident because I began as a city councilwoman. And then I was the secretary of the state of Connecticut. So by the time I ran for Congress, uh, I felt comfortable being in public office. And that's why, you know, I tell young women when the, you know, the Congress had come in and say, oh, I'd love to be in Congress. And I said, well, you better go home because you're not going to run from Washington. And most women get their start, Board of Education, City Council, or of course a lot in the legislature. So um, <clears throat> not, not many women just run for Congress. Now that's different with men. Often, uh, of course, most of the men and most of the members of Congress still are lawyers. And many a lawyer has just said, you know, I'm, I'm just sick of practicing law and I'm going to run for Congress <laughs> without running for local office. But I think women really, uh, uh, they, they can't quite do it that way. They, it shows that you have you know, Barbara Mikulski, uh, city council. I mean, it, it's uh, from the mm -hmm. bottom. But uh, what I'm worried about more is the paucity of, of women. I, I, we, we've leveled out now. And uh, you know, we were always so thrilled. Uh, when, uh, Lynn was in the uh, Congress, it uh, was the year of the woman. The year of the woman. Oh, we were yeah. so thrilled. Yeah. But uh, we haven't had that many thrills lately, and uh, I, I'm really, I'm really concerned uh, that we have to do better uh, to uh, have more women. And I think one of the things is the business is not that attractive. I mean, I was so honored to be a member of Congress, and right now the business does look very good. I mean, it, and that it, transcends it's, gender. Not, not right. only, no, but not only the sexism. The idea that under our constitution, our government is is uh, Compromise, and nobody wants to compromise. And you know, we could go on about that. And so, uh, I think it's not as attractive a job as as, as it used to be. Hmm. Well, I guess I'm the exception to the uh, running for or being in local elected office because I never held elected office before I ran for Congress. However, I was very involved in my community and particularly in feminist. Yes, I use the word feminist. <laughs> causes uh, back in the day, a long time ago. Uh, yeah, I'm from San Diego, California, as progressive as, Sa as California is. Uh, we had laws that basically said uh, that women uh, could not have management and control over community property if they were married. It, the law said it was in the hands of, of the husband. And there were all these kinds of uh, laws that, as a lawyer, uh, we got involved with changing the law, but uh, also we couldn't eat lunch anywhere we wanted. In downtown San Diego, back in those days, there weren't too many uh, nice places, a lot of places for sailors to have, to have <laughs> lunch, but not for, for lawyers. Uh, there was a restaurant in a hotel that was where the power brokers would meet, the mayor and judges, etc. And there was a sign outside that said, men only from noon to three. So uh, a couple of friends and I decided we were going to figure out how to make that change and take that sign down. And 
I won't go into all the detail because I'm told that this is going to be on the internet, so <laughs> it's better that, <laughs> that, that the details, the sausage making stay with me. But we got it changed. And the first time that three of us were seated, these, found, these fathers of San Diego booed us. So, uh, you know, that ridicule that uh, we were subjected to in that and, and other arenas really started to get me thinking that uh, I, I don't want to just advocate for changes in the law. I want to be there to change the law. So that's when I decided to run. Now, Margot, obviously you have not run for office, but you are still in an exclusive club as a woman chief of staff on Capitol <coughs> Hill. And I wonder if you've given thought, I'm sure you have, to why there aren't more women in your position, um, especially among Republicans. You were telling me backstage that uh, fewer than, less than 20% of women um, chief, or 25% 25% of Republican chiefs of staff are women. So why do you think that is, and what do you think could uh, change it? We reflect a lot of the issues that are being discussed, and even tonight is a great example. My husband is at home because my 19-month-old daughter is sick, so he couldn't come, and I am here, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, but it is, there, there are real choices that you make and sacrifices that you make when you decide to take my job as the chief of staff supporting the members. And not everyone wants to do that, and when you and your spouse, I've had the conversation with my husband about, look, if the kid gets sick during the day, I've got to go to the Capitol, <laughs> and you are going to have to stay with our daughter or our son. Um, so I think that those are real conversations that happen at home, and often, even today, it's going to be the husband who will take that kind of leadership role um, when it comes to work and family balance and decisions. I can say a lot of the women members, um, Barbara Comstock has been very vocal about she really made the decision um, to wait until her kids were out of the house before she wanted to run for Congress. But you'll hear that more from women members and from women staffers. When I first decided to become a chief, I had more than one person say to me, oh, wow, you know, don't you have really young kids? Hmm. which is code, right? But yes, <laughs> I do, that I can do this job, and I have talked to my husband about it, so thank you very much for your concern. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel like, um, because you talk to chiefs of staff, obviously, of both parties, do you feel like mm -hmm. that varies depending on whether you are a Democrat or a Republican, or is that pretty consistent across the board? No, these are just people issues. You know, it's family, it's not even, I mean, I. My husband and I are married, we've got two kids, but this crosses the gamut. Um, divorced parents, they have the same issues, single mom, single dad, Republican, Democrat, it's, we're all facing the same challenges. So one of the things that um, I have found just fabulous about women um, working in government and politics is kind of the support systems that they create for themselves to try to encourage the women that are already in their positions and then try to grow their ranks. Um, and Lynn and Barbara, you both had a great story that you shared on a conference call in advance of this panel tonight um, where you shared, Lynn, what happened to you when you arrived in Congress yeah. and Barbara, you were already there. Yeah. Um, and I believe we're sort of a welcoming party for, for I believe you were sort of a welcoming party for the new women members who came in oh, in Lynn's right. class. Yeah, yeah. so uh, Nita Lowy was then the chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Women's Caucus. In fact, there was an anniversary dinner mm -hmm. last night, and uh, we had a wonderful time of Democrats and Republicans. Uh, the caucus was started 40 years ago by Liz Holtzman and Margaret Heckler, and every, uh, every session there was a Democrat and a Republican woman who chaired this, and the year that I was elected, Nita Lowy was uh, the Democratic uh, co-chair, uh, but she and Barbara, when uh, we showed up, we, the 24 new women, just came and embraced us, and Nita actually gave us a breaking the glass ceiling pin that I still have and, <laughs> and treasure, 
and uh, brought us together with the women on the other side of the aisle. And that was, uh, I don't know if that's the only bipartisan caucus left in Congress, but it's it, certainly. Wait a minute, I, I'm sitting here, is it left? Well, I th yeah, I it think so. it is. Yes. Yeah. It is. And Nita Lowy's chief is one of my moms and chiefs. Yeah. 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 So it was, it well, was I'm wonderful. Th I'm thrilled to hear it, because that's the only place yeah. in Congress that you have that, Democrats in and, and Right, and we would, we would gather in what became known as the Lindy Boggs Room, uh, mm -hmm. were women members of both parties, and we would talk about issues that related to women, violence against women, uh, all kinds of, of issues. And uh, I actually became uh, pretty good friends with uh, Jennifer Dunn, who I believe, unfortunately, is now deceased. But we had uh, an interest in the same designer. So yes, we did talk about clothes, <laughs> too. <laughs> oh, and she and I once sneaked away and went to a mall in Virginia where we heard this designer had, was having a show. <laughs> and, and, and we, we're, we said, oh, what if we get recognized? Well, nobody recognizes you. you know? <laughs> so we had no problems. But I just wanted to say my chief of staff a long time ago uh, was a woman. And she had three children under the age of six at the time. So phenomenal. Uh, yes, and, and it really was. But uh, I, all I said to her was, Lori, you have to be in the office on Friday afternoon because that's when it hits the fan. That's when <laughs> you know the, the reporters will call and say, where is she? Is she there? <laughs> uh, and so other than that, she could set her own schedule. And, and did. Thank you. <laughs> and so, Barbara, why was this so important to you at the time to be a part of this, to have this support system in place for new women who were coming in? Um, what was the point of that? Of the, of the Women's Caucus? Mm -hmm. Well, it was very nice. And uh, as I said, there's no caucuses anymore that, that have both Republicans and Democrats in. And it, the times have changed, really, uh, from they are now. Uh, I know that women tend to get along better with each other often than men do. But uh, some of my very good friends were, were Republicans. And uh, that was so pleasant. It really was. You had a broad area to, uh, to know. But it's not quite the same now anymore. I mean, you could, you could see it the other night at the speech. It's a, it's, a, it's a fence kind of there between Republicans and Democrats, which I don't think is uh, as pleasant as it was. I mean. Nancy Johnson, a Republican from Connecticut, told me we didn't agree on anything, but we were very, very dear friends. And I don't think you have the opportunity to do that as much as, as you did when you are so separated by the votes and, and, and really uh, the decisions that are being made. So uh, I, but of course there's more women now, which is very, very good. I mean, when I, when I came 22 women, I mean, you didn't have much of a choice who, you, who your best friends were going to be. <laughs> Let me just interject one fact that we learned last night that, as I said before, was stunning to me, that over 12,000 people have served in the United States Congress since the inception of our nation, and just a little over 300 have been women, 300 out of 12,000, so we're a long way to go. Absolutely. Before, I do want to touch more on recruiting and how to get more women involved, but Margo, you mentioned briefly your Moms in Chief group, and it's worth noting, I think, that there is a support system for women on the staff side as well in Congress. So could you explain that a little bit? It's really interesting. So frankly, Sorry. I think we really didn't want to know how few of us there were <laughs> for a long time. And um, I was, I I was pregnant with my first in my first year of being a chief of staff. And one of my friends, um, Parker Poling, who is McHenry's chief of staff, and another friend of ours, they invited a group of senior staff women together to have a shower for me. And it wasn't a gift shower. It was a, all right, you're having a kid. We need to sit you down <laughs> and help you. Here is how this is going to work. Um, and it was a really warm event. In some respects, I will admit, and it was interesting your comment about the first, the first president, female president being a Republican, it makes me think of this. I really valued those women in my life in a way that I had never truly valued a network of women before when I had my first kid and was inspired to turn that shower into a formal group of moms-in-chief because we do face unique issues. 
Um, but I think as a Republican, you often are kind of forced to shut down that side of you and have this very strong, outward-facing persona. And so having the Moms in Chief was a really neat way to get to know each other at a deeper level, more personal, and be able to even talk about our kids. I mean, I would even hate to talk about being pregnant. Hit it for months. Didn't want anyone to know. You know, didn't want that veneer of strength and stability to be, a, you know, tapped out a little bit by having a kid. So the group has grown. It has grown. And you don't only talk about mom issues, right? <laughs> yes. You talk about policy and politics as well. Yes. So I told you the story. One of my favorite moments in Moms in Chief was when we were talking about the Supreme Court constitutional challenge to the Virginia redistricting lines and the implications it would have on the upcoming race. I mean, this really heavy stuff. And then not two minutes later, we were talking about bunting and where we could get the best outfits for our kids for Easter. <laughs> But it's a very rare place where you can be serious policy and then also on the flip side be a serious, you know, woman and mom. So Lynn was mentioning earlier, Anne Marie, the women's issues in terms of policy that you would be able to talk about with other women in Congress. But obviously women think about every sort of policy issue in a different way. I was looking back at a speech that Madeleine Albright gave at Wellesley a few years ago, and she noted that women think of security issues in a different way, more holistically, economic issues. So I'm wondering if you saw that when you were in Congress or yourself experienced just uh, any sort of divide between the way that men and women approached policy. I think, I think it's just a difference in the male versus the female. How we look at things, how we handle things, Women tend to be multitaskers. I mean, I just know that because I have had to be one, you know. It's just, you constantly are able to deal with several issues because if you don't, something's gonna go crashing down. So you figure out a way to be chief of staff and to have two small kids and to be married. You just figure out a way to make it work if, if that's what you choose to do. And, um, you know, I think there there is a problem in We've talked about how few women there are. I was the first woman to ever hold the seat in Congress from my district um, because it is difficult. It is difficult. That's why those support systems are so important because it's, a, it's extremely difficult. I had an elderly mother back in the district. I have 17 grandkids. At the time, I had 15 and six kids. And so you're, you're constantly trying to make it work. And then, as Barbara pointed out, there's this you know, this tension between Republicans and Democrats, which, um, and I'll just tell you this, the, the media doesn't help us because it's a 24-hour news cycle and there's always, they're constantly pointing out to the bad things. I mean, I was in a pro, uh, a bipartisan caucus with uh, Carolyn Maloney on human trafficking. I mean, we we took that issue on and that's an issue some members, some male members have gotten involved since, but it was something that we thought was important, you know. so. We do think of things different. We do think things differently. We handle things differently. But I think that's what makes it work is because there are two different perspectives. Yeah, but I, I, I think the lack of women hurts some of our issues very definitely. Uh, there's, there's so many things that we really need in this country. Uh, uh, we need equal pay for equal work. Uh, we need daycare, absolutely. Uh, paid maternity leave. There's some in those issues are really women's issues, and we think about them all the time. But they were not that high on the men's, uh, on their concerns. I mean, they were way down. And so what worries me is there's not more women. We can't get those things passed. Uh, there's not enough of us to trade votes. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, we need more women to get things that women absolutely need and children absolutely need. And it, I mean, we talk about it and talk about it, but it doesn't happen. So, so what do you think are some of the, the uh, some of the things that women can do, men can do, the political parties can do to encourage more women to run and to get more women elected ultimately? Well, first of all, the party leaders, uh, uh, the ones that uh, get the nominations to the individuals, uh, have to look to more women because we have totally proven uh, when women run, women win. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's that you know you're having a there's an opening in a seat for Congress and. Often the, the uh, state chairman is a man, so he looks at so, uh, someone to take that place who looks like him, and it's it's you have to push yourself uh, forward. Uh, we don't have as many opportunities uh, to run. Uh, 
leadership is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. We say how little, yes. how, how little we are in the, in the Congress. Nancy Pelosi, of course, absolutely, she, she was a speaker, and now she's a, a top Democrat. But I was so, the first woman elected uh, to uh, an office. Uh, uh, I was elected to uh, be uh, the uh, vice president of the Democratic caucus. And I was the first woman elected. They would appoint a secretary, but I was elected. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about that, we had a race uh, just this year for a second, uh, vice president of the caucus. There had not been one since I was in Congress. Mm -hmm. So you look at the leadership, you know, Nancy's up there, she's absolutely wonderful. But you go down, and there's not that many in leadership. And we were all so delighted that we just got a second one. So, mm -hmm. No, you know, numbers count. Numbers count, and when, you, when you're in such a minority, it's very hard to get to places. Uh, luckily, we have some women, uh, a number of women that you, you know, that are uh, in, a, in the Democratic Party who have stayed long enough so that they can be chairman of committees. I mean, they have stayed. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and those are women that were there when I was, uh, was there. But it takes a long time for a woman to get a chairmanship. I think Barbara's exactly right about the role of leadership. I was the first woman in history to be elected south of Los Angeles. Now, south of wow. Los Angeles to the border is a very big area. Never had a woman. Mm. And when I declared that I was going to run, my party's leadership uh, ignored me, uh, literally ignored me. And not only that, wouldn't even meet with me, much less talk about putting any money into my campaign or helping me in any way. And so actually it was kind of liberating because when I was elected, you know, I wasn't <laughs> beholden to the leadership. But, but the, the point is that it, the, the leadership does have a very important role to play in encouraging women, in, in thinking about women running. It just, uh, I think it's changed a little bit, uh, but not a whole lot on either side of the aisle, I would suspect. I, I'd like to tell another story. I was very fortunate. Uh, be put on the uh, Ways and Means Committee, and you have to run for those co good committees. And I got on the committee very early. Uh, I came in a special, just landed there, and then I decided I, I had had younger children, and I had left them to go to Congress. Mm -hmm. So I decided I'm not just staying here to be on any committee. So I ran for Ways and Means, and, and uh, I got on Ways and Means, and which I just loved. But a couple, oh, probably six years or so after that, uh, I said to uh, Tip O'Neill, who had been speaker when I went on Ways and Means, I said, Tip, I really think there's never been a woman on intelligence. And I think it's terrible that there's never been a woman on the important committee like the Intelligence Committee. And he looked at me and he said, Barbara, are you never satisfied? And <laughs> so I waited for the next speaker to come. <laughs> so the next speaker came and I went, you know, there's never been a woman, war and peace and all the rest. And he appointed me. <laughs> so I was the first woman on the intelligence committee. <laughs> That's amazing. But you know, Barbara brings up a good point. It, it requires you to put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. and, and for some reason, some women just don't want to do that. I mean, I had the same experience you did when I was going to run. There was a fairly well-to-do male mm -hmm. was kind of positioned, and he was sort of the heir apparent for no good reason other than he, they thought he could self-fund and it was an uphill battle race. And, and we just slogged it out. It just took weeks and months of going to the committee meetings and having those conversations and trying to move it. But it is, it's a challenge. I mean, it is a challenge regardless of what party to to get them to think, and I'm sure, um, yeah. Same, the same challenge. Exactly it right. hasn't changed. Yep. And it's, I will say, when um, most recently Kathy Morris Rogers was floated for Interior Secretary, and there was a little bit of an argument that she, should she get it, she should be replaced by a woman. And we, in the Moms in Chief crew, had a really interesting discussion about I mean, that's good because she's the only one. And so, yes, we would love to have another woman. But at the same time, the flip side to that is, well, does this mean this job will always be the woman's job? <laughs> and now no other position of leadership will be available. Or if there is a woman in that job, then that box has been checked off. And so don't worry about it for the rest of them. So it was a really, it's a real question that we have to be cognizant of when we're having these discussions. Good step forward this year with the Budget Committee and Diane Black. 
Yes, and she's fabulous. Yes. And I imagine this is a similar struggle from a staffing perspective, not only at the chief of staff level, but making sure that your office is diverse and you have that diversity of opinion. Because in the same way that it helps to have a women's perspective when you're making policy, I imagine it's the same when you're making decisions as a staff. Well, it's interesting. I don't know if anyone remembers this came up in the presidential race that Hillary, the question was whether she had more, significantly more female staff than male staff. And um, someone, a reporter did go through, and I think that she had more women than men. But it was so funny to me, again, that it was almost like this was being flipped on her, and that it was an attack that she had mm -hmm. these powerful women and that they had positions of authority. So as a chief, I almost find myself worrying more about having too many women and then being judged for surrounding myself with women, especially now I work for a woman, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I sometimes stop myself and I'm like, wow, did I really just sit here and wonder, should I hire her or not because she's yeah. a woman and I should reconsider the man? And meanwhile, you have Justin Trudeau in Canada who decided at least half of his cabinet had to be women, no questions asked. And when he was criticized for it by some people or asked about it, he said, well, it was at the time 2015. He said, it's 2015. That was the end of the discussion. So it's, it's funny that we can be having this discussion here that it could be an attack for a woman running for president here and then a man um, in Canada, their president. There was no question that half of his staff had to be women. Right. It's very different. Um, since we're on this subject of campaigns, I was talking to a woman last night who has worked in Republican politics for a long time, worked with both men and women. Um, and she pointed out also that aside from the challenges a lot of times we think of when it comes to women running for office, recruiting them in the first place, some of the perception issues that they have to deal with, um, fundraising is also another issue. She noted that you could have, and this is one anecdote, not always um, consistent across the board, but she noted you could have a male member of Congress and a woman member of Congress, Congress going to the same room of donors, and the man would come out with more money than the woman. Is this kind of consistent with what you all have had to deal with? Uh, the statistics <clears throat> have got much better. Uh, women now are able to raise as much money as men have. It used to be much harder, but now it's, 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 fair, it's equal. Once you get in there and you're going for a, a senator or a house seat, you can raise that money. So what changed, do you think? What changed? I don't know, maybe. Women began to win. <laughs> <laughs> they like, money likes to go with the winner. <laughs> well, I think that's a, a good challenge. point. Yeah, that's yeah, a I think that is a very good point. If, you, yes. if you're an underdog in a race or you're in a, a questionable yeah. you know, race where you odds are you're not going to win, or there's a perception you might not win, the, don the donations just and the contributions just mm -hmm. trickle in. I mean, it's just a challenge. Mostly it's grassroots contributions unless you can self-fund. So it is part yeah, of and that. I, and I think that uh, it was very difficult when I ran, and I'm sure when you, it, it, that was very true. Uh, either you came out with nothing or far less than the, than the male. What, what has changed is that uh, women have gotten comfortable asking <coughs> for money, mm -hmm. and uh, a, a younger friend wanted to run, and I talked to her about fundraising, and I said, we're going to go through a practice drill. You're going to call me, you know, <laughs> and you're going to tell me that you're running, etc., and, you know, and we'll see how you close the deal. And so she called me and told me that she wanted to run and why, etc., and then nothing. I said, well, thank you very much for the call. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she called me back, and she said, you hung up on me. I said, well, you didn't close. You didn't make the ask. She, to this day, she will tell you she never forgets to close. And I think women have really learned to do that now. Well, and of course, we have to, uh, when we're talking about the numbers, uh, we have to include the idea of incumbency. Once you're an incumbent, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, of course, more men are incumbents. Uh, they have a much easier time than the challenger. Absolutely. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier, Barbara, that you think there is less bipartisanship, even among women, than there was when you were in Congress, for example. But on the Senate side, with the women in the Senate, I think we've seen a great degree still of bipartisanship. They still have... Um, dinners constantly where they get together and talk about policy, talk about life. 
um, when a couple of years ago, DC was shut down by a blizzard. It was the women in the Senate of both parties who kept the Senate running exclusively. They were the ones who showed up in the snow. Um, and they had sort of this unspoken rule on most issues that they would work out their differences behind the scenes, not criticize each other publicly, um, a really different approach than what you see with a lot of the men um, and some of the fights that they can get into. So I, I wonder if in your experiences, I mean, you mentioned, Barbara, that you think it has changed, but Anne-Marie, do you think, um, was that sort of what you saw with women in Congress? You know, we, <clears throat> we really, we did do things. There was some bipartisanship. Um, it was the reality of now, the way Congress is maybe versus several years ago, the members expected to leave Washington on Friday afternoon and go home and do what they need to do home and then maybe come back Monday afternoon. And then you hit the ground running. When Congress is in session, you're taking meetings, you're on the floor, you're voting. You're and so there is less opportunity, I think, than there used to be for some of that socialness. I think the schedules have changed a little bit. And you'll hear that the relationship building, whether it was among females or Republicans and Democrats, it had to do more, it has to do more now practically. The time is, the schedules have changed and there's much more of a demand for that member to be in their district and not to be staying behind in Washington, you know, and, and ostensibly ignoring their district. And so I think that has a lot to do with mm -hmm. how the relationships, there's just no time to sit, I mean, I, you can, you know, Cla you know Claudia is a member now. I mean, I, you just don't think to say, you know, when you're done at the end of the day and you're it's nine o'clock, eight thirty, nine o'clock, you're walking out of the house, out of the Capitol building. You just, I don't feel like doing anything but going home. <laughs> you're, just, <laughs> you're just not thinking about being social. I mean, it, we, so it's well, a little. This is a whole different thing, though. Now, uh, you used to uh, your trips were not paid to go home. There, there, was, there was a big difference then. If you wanted to go home, you had to pay your own way to go home. Now it's unlimited pay to go home. Yeah, it comes out of your office. So, right. and uh, I, I, I don't understand why they have to go home so much. They are not here that much. We have legislatures in every state that are very competent to do the state business. Uh, the, these members of Congress now spend enough time at home to be on the staff at home. I mean, it, it's <laughs> Especially in an election year. It's no, wrong. You just it, have it's, moved to the district. It's absolutely wrong, but the, yeah. the thing is so much has changed. People used to bring their families here, mm -hmm. and the families would get to know each other, Republicans, Democrats, mm -hmm. and there was uh, the social coming together. Uh, that's all over. That, and that's another thing that goes, I think, toward not uh, having the friendships that you used to have between Republicans and Democrats. Wives got to know each other, and the children got to know each other. But that's all over. That's all over. I swear to God something's going to happen to those California people that go home every single weekend and then come back. <laughs> you know, lose something. <laughs> <laughs> it's exhausting. Well, well, it's good for airline. Part, part of that, though, is with the election of more women, you know, husbands had their own careers. The kids mm -hmm. were in school. There. Husbands didn't relocate to Washington the way in the old days the wives who were stay-at-home wives didn't have mm -hmm. careers moved to Washington. So that was a, a, a downside, although uh, you know, my husband tried to come as much as he could, but you know, he couldn't leave his life and his profession to come to Washington. But I think what, it's more than the, because uh, you're right, you know, there isn't enough time in Washington Part of it is the constituency demand. I remember even when I was in, briefly in the House, my uh, chief of staff, who w I stayed in San Diego, by the way, called me laughing. She said, you're not going to believe what just happened. What happened? A constituent showed up in the office, the district office, and said, I want to see Congresswoman Shank. And Lori said, well, she's in Washington. And he said, what the hell is she doing there? She should be here you know, meeting with me. So it, we have allowed that to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of it is we have to educate the constituency and the public that really members of Congress should be in Washington doing the job here. That is funny. So I've been astounded by some of the stories you hear from women when they first come to Washington, senators, members of Congress. Kelly Ayotte, when she was walking with Marco Rubio as a newly elected senator, was mistaken for his wife. Claire McCaskill went to the Senate floor and they told her that she needed 
a pass to get on the floor, and she said, well, I earned my pass. I'm a senator now. They are often not recognized as lawmakers, and I assume as chiefs of staff. Is this something that you all had to deal with, having to assert yourselves, establish your, your respect? How many war stories do you want? All of us. <laughs> Where you do you begin? Oh my gosh, I was on energy and commerce and we were having one of those huge hearings with hundreds of people and I was running late because we always ran late, right? And I went up to the door and the Capitol Police uh, put his hand up, sorry ma'am, you'll have to go to the overflow room. And I said, no, no, I, I, I have to, no, uh, overflow room. <laughs> and, and I said, I, I'm a member. And he looked at me and I said, you see this pin? It cost me $2 million by the most expensive piece of jewelry. You're going to let me in. You know? And so I, I, he was skeptical, but, but he let me in. But, uh, magical pin. Uh, one other time, we, uh, my, my husband did come in and, uh, to town, and we were going over to the Senate side, the other body, as we called it, right? Did I get that right? Uh, <laughs> my husband was a very distinguished-looking uh, professor with white hair, and he was in his suit and he had his spouse pin on, spouse pin. And we're walking across to meet uh, Senator Feinstein and her husband for dinner, and we walked over to the Senate side, and again, the Capitol Police uh, looks at him and, and looks at me and says, uh, Senator, is she with you? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yeah, she's with me. <laughs> so, but those were the little indignities. The biggest indignity was when I found out that there isn't a women's restroom mm -hmm. right off the house floor. And I don't know if that's there changed. Is changed. It has changed. changed. Yes. We used to go through the speaker's gallery, down a hallway, through the speaker's office, to finally get to the restroom. And everybody knew that you where you were going. <laughs> <laughs> and didn't you, Barbara, have to show her where that restroom was? Show who? Show Lynn where yeah. that restroom was. Show, when show she first I was always bus. very nice. <laughs> <laughs> it was always very helpful. Always very helpful. <laughs> must do. Excellent mentor. <laughs> but how about you, Margo, from a staff perspective? Have you ever had to assert yourself in any way among other chiefs or among lawmakers? Or do you someone, feel like you've been taken Someone seriously? once thought that I was Jeff Wartenberry's daughter, which kind of a compliment. <laughs> who, who was your boss? <laughs> who was my time? boss, yes. And I was definitely his chief of staff. Uh, um, you, you learn long before you get here how to push through that. So there's a certain assertiveness that you build before you actually take these jobs. You're going through all the things that we're talking about. So I now am very aware of myself and making sure that I don't, for example, it is my tendency, and I will say a lot of women probably do this, to kind of sit in the background, be on the Blackberry, you know, not be the chief. And so I have had to be cognizant of training myself to walk into a room. Hello, I'm Margaret Matera, chief of staff. And people do want to go to the guy on the staff. So you, you do train yourself to push through it. How about you all? Any war stories? You know, I, I can't say. I got down to Congress, and I found a pretty welcoming group. Um, there were, that year, there were a number of us. There were three nurses who were elected, Diane Black, Renee Elmers, and myself. I mean, it just was, it was, it was okay. It wasn't, um, I had worked so hard to get there that when I got there, it was just wonderful. It was just how, and, and when your party is in the majority, you can be speaker, you can so, you're temporary speaker when the house is in session, you, you're up there and you're thinking, how did this happen? You know, in 1969, when I graduated from high school, they told me I could be a nurse, a teacher, a secretary, a mother, when a Catholic high school, you could have been a nun. And, <laughs> and now here I am, a member of Congress, first woman to hold the seat. So I'm optimistic, and, and that was kind of the feeling I had. I was just so grateful to have this opportunity. And, and so I, I think that's kind of how I perceive things. It is pretty amazing that we're sitting here 100 years after the first woman served in Congress, 100 years this year, um, as I believe the archivist mentioned in his opening remarks. Um, and so, uh, to close before we open this up well, for I, questions. I'd just like to say one thing before. Uh, right. We've kind of brought out the downside 
And uh, I, I was there 17 years. I loved every minute of it, absolutely every minute of it. I still miss it terribly. So, I mean, it, it's a great place to serve. It really is. It's and, and for those who came later, we owe a debt of gratitude to the Lynns and to the Barbaras who blazed the trail, who maybe it wasn't such a welcoming place. Um, yes, you loved it, but things were, you know, different. And so every generation, not that your generation had us, but <laughs> for, <Yes>. forge, that, <laughs> forge that path. And, and, and we're doing it for the generation behind us, and, and that generation will do it for them, those behind them. And it's important that women do that for each other, that they look out regardless of your beliefs or your positions on policy, regardless where, you know, the, we need to be more cohesive, we need to be more supportive of each other, we need to be, to, as Margot said, to understand we have so much more in common than we do different. And the challenges that we face and our interests and, and all of that, that should be something that puts us together and not separates us out in terms of parties. And uh, I think that's why we enjoy doing these things so much because these events give us the opportunity to encourage young women to be involved and to know that regardless of the path you take to get there, you can get there. And I, and I do want to ask, oh, you can applaud. That was lovely. <laughs> Um, one of the other remarks that Madeleine Albright made about women in government and politics was that momentum builds on itself. And at this stage when women have made so much progress, as you so eloquently pointed out, Anne-Marie, I wonder, in closing, if you all could maybe discuss what you see as the opportunities for women at this stage and also moving forward um, in politics and government. I'll start. Uh, I don't know about the opportunities as much as I know of the need. Uh, which, when talking, we have not broken 20% in the House, have not broken that. that. That's unbelievable at this point in time. And we have to have those issues that are important to women up there. And won't, they won't be up there until there are more and more women. But the whole thing is, I think women, uh, I say I was so happy. I don't know if men would say they were so happy all the time. We need women in that body uh, to protect the things in this country that we, we hold so dear. And, uh, you know, I, I'll tell you something. I think one of the things that has hurt us is not having as many women's schools. Uh, you think of uh, Nancy Pelosi, the speaker, went to a, uh, Trinity College here in Washington, mm -hmm. and Kellyanne went to Trinity College here in Washington. And the idea of when you go to a woman's school, you know you can be president of the class. You know you can be... Uh, everybody that is anything. And uh, I went to Annapolis once. Uh, we have, which we were talking about earlier, college to campus for former members. And uh, went to Annapolis, and I couldn't believe it, that the, that, that the women were kind of letting the men take over at Annapolis. And you know, those are very capable women. So I don't know. Uh, I just wish we had more women's schools to say, you know, you can be number one. You don't have to hold back. You can do just as well as a man can. But it's really very, very important that we get more women to run because we're not doing what we should be doing at the moment. Well, I was just reflecting on what Margot said about would this become a woman's seat or would this mm -hmm. become a woman's plan? Well, my hope, my aspiration, my dream is that uh, half of those seats in the House of Representatives will be thought of as women's seats, and maybe even more, so, right? <laughs> but women have to run. Well, they have to run, and we have to encourage them to run, because uh, they have to understand that they do make a difference. It doesn't mean that uh, they are all in lockstep, but uh, our life experience is different. Uh, that we're not only mothers and grandmothers, but daughters and uh, wives, and that is just a very different life experience. And, Women do horse trade for women's issues, whereas men, who are supporters, uh, you know, they, they will support many of our issues, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't get them through, but it's not on their top three about what they're willing to horse trade for what's important to them. I'll give you this vote if you give me that vote. I mean, that's the reality, right? And uh, so it is very important that women run, that women stand up, speak out, and uh, take their rightful place in the Congress. 
Well, I, have anything else? I just would agree with what all of my colleagues have said, and it's not easy, but anything worthwhile generally takes an awful lot of work, blood, sweat, and tears. And whether it's on your school board, as Barbara mentioned early in the uh, program, or it's the Congress of the United States, uh, it's your, lo your city, your state, your country needs you to serve. And so um, one of the things we do with the College to Campus program is we talk about public service, we talk about getting involved. And despite the fact that right now it seems, and it has seemed for many years, like it's nasty and you know, it's a place you don't want to go to, it is. And your, your voice, your single voice can make a huge difference. It's just, I, I don't even know how to say it, other than you sitting there in that seat can make a difference as a woman running for office and being involved. And maybe it isn't you running, but you encouraging someone to run and saying, I'll be with you. I'll stay with you. The people I have in Cong had in Congress with me are now over in my Consumer Product Safety Commission in my office. You build relationships, you support each other, you get to know each other, and uh, it's, it's, it's so important that you get involved. Do you have anything you'd like to say in closing, Margo? That it's important. Question. We, no matter political divide as women do, Remember that we can only do this together. And um, not to be afraid to also be a woman. I think that's a great note to end on. Yeah. But we do have some time for questions. And I believe there are microphones on either side. So if you do have a question, please line up behind either one. Um, and we'd be happy to have the panel address it. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Answered all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> all. We're good. <laughs> all right. Well, I can. You going to the microphone? All right. We'll this start over here. This is intimidating. You have to walk up <laughs> to a microphone, but you said go out there. So, um, well, my name is Taylor Gates. I'm from I'm a senior from the University of Georgia, and it's been a pleasure to hear from all all of you. So thank you so much for coming out. Um, my question is, I was just talking to a coworker about mine who spent some time with the NRCC, working towards um, campaigning for women, getting them in office. But she did say, and I think we touched on this today, um, a lot of the women they look for to promote in office uh, are women who are capable of self funding. So they are these millionaire women. Um, how do we address that and kind of this divide of not only gender, but race and class and promoting women to office? And what are ways we can kind of work to address that? That's a marvelous question. <laughs> and, um, I think one of the things we can do um, is not just when it comes to women, but in general, fundraising has become such a, such a central part of, uh, of, of a campaign. It's become, even when you're a member, you know the publications come out when your when your quarterly reports are filed, and they judge the quality of the member by how much money they raise that quarter. I mean that's perverse. I used to think to myself, gee, I got three committees, seven subcommittees. What am I doing over at the NRCC making phone calls? And that's where they would direct you to go to make phone calls. So I think the whole the way we look at fundraising and the cost, the elections. You mentioned your election was two million dollars. My election, I think, was the most expensive election um, in, in, in the history of my district for sure, but it ended up between the two of us being a $15 million election. How much? $15 million. It was crazy the amount of money. <laughs> because, because my district is a swing seat, and so it can go back and forth, and so those are the oh, districts the where question. they really <laughs> focus, both sides focus a lot of money because they know oh, we can get that back. So I think from my perspective, the way we look at fundraising, the way we value fundraising, and the cost of elections. There has to be a, a very broadly, I think on both sides of the aisle, a discussion about that because mm -hmm. it's, it's the tail wagging the dog in a lot of situations. You should have run for the Senate. They cost $15 million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, then you have six years. That would have been that, good. <laughs> I congratulate you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Anna? Hi, my name is Hannah. Um, I want to thank you guys all for uh, blazing the trail and for being here. Um, my question is, what advice would you give um, to women of the next generation to encourage other women to not be satisfied with the underrepresentation that we're um, seeing in Congress even still today? Have you thought about running? 
<laughs> a little bit. I'm from Arkansas, so the hopes are, oh, you know, but, you know. <laughs> there are some great, powerful women from Arkansas. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We don't have any women in Congress right now, but who knows? Well, I, I think that's, that's the thing. We have got to make women think, well, this isn't just another choice among choices. That this has become a very serious problem that we don't have more women because our issues are not being paid attention to because of the lack of women. So you could do it in Arkansas. I, I can okay. tell. <laughs> okay, so run for office. Got it. <laughs> but, you know, it the, the, the mood of the country now, you know, and, and the divisiveness and the, the partisanship, uh, I can understand why not only women but some men don't want to run. They don't want to come to. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a more nuanced issue than just getting people to run. It's what do we do to change the, the atmosphere in the Congress? What do we do to go back to some of the, the, the old days of, of comedy and getting along, you know, when, when uh, Ronald Reagan and, and Tip O'Neill were uh, great good friends and, and could argue and then still go out and drink whatever it is these two Irish guys drank. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, or that when Jennifer and I could go looking for the same designer, you know, as, as fluffy as that might sound. Uh, how do we come back to that? So it's really your generation and your generation that has to demand that kind of change so that people of goodwill of both parties and both sexes will want to run for office. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, hi, we've discussed this in the vacuum of Congress. Do you know if representation in Congress is all that different from represent, representation in the rest of corporate America? Uh, I mean, is, is this just indicative of a bigger problem, or is there something unique about uh, women's representation in Congress? Well, I, th in, in, uh, I, I serve on two um, Fortune 300 corporate boards, and I will tell you, for years I was the only woman, and now on both boards we have uh, three women, you know, and out of 11 or 12. So it's reflective of what is the situation in corporate America. I think state legislators, or legislatures are getting better at it. You know, in California, for example, we have more women representation in, in the state legislature than, uh, than we do percentage-wise than in, in Congress. But uh, you know, we've got a long way to go in every segment of our society. Well, the uh, Forbes 400 group, when you think of the paucity of women there. Right, CEOs, yes. very few women it's, CEOs. It's awful. It's just, I think it's 15% uh, or something, mm -hmm. very small. And they face a lot of the same issues. I was off the Hill for a very brief period before coming back after Trump won. And the challenges were even, frankly, in a lot of ways amplified that I wanted to stay married I wanted my kids to remember who I was. I was traveling constantly. Um, the, I was just exhausted. My family was exhausted. And I was trying to really push my career and be doing the most that I could for my job, but then also looking at my family and being like, is this sustainable? I mean, these are issues that are certainly the same. You know, it's just it's a high-powered, high-energy, demanding job. And um, we all have to kind of have a serious chat with ourselves about, you know, how do we make it work? Right. When I uh, graduated from law school, my first job, and at the time I was 44, and this is now my first foray into law, I worked in a firm. And I can remember we used to have a <clears throat> morning meeting every morning at 8 o'clock, meet in the conference room and go over the cases for the day. And I would, by 8 o'clock in the morning, I would have gotten the six kids on a bus. I was a single mother get the kids on the bus, get their lunches packed, get them off to school, and then get to work. And I'd get to the t table, and I felt like I'd been up all night just about. And I'd least look around at all the guys there who were all composed, drinking a cup of coffee. <laughs> and I said to them, I need a wife. I mean, I don't know how else to say this. It's just, it, it, it was very difficult, because if that's what you're doing, then you're balancing. You're doing a lot more juggling. You don't have someone at home who's willing to do that, or at least share it with you. 
congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you all very much for your time and for your insight. I did just want to first point out there are a number of special elections that are going to be happening uh, in the months ahead where a lot of well-qualified people who happen to be women are running. Karen Handel in Georgia, Amanda Curtis in Montana, several running for Congressman Becerra's seat in California. So this is a great opportunity right now also to, to get the word out and hopefully kick the numbers up. Uh, but I did want to ask you all about the Ivanka effect, that she's credited a lot for raising issues about paid family leave, childcare policies, and encouraging her father to get the word out on those policies. And I know that uh, Congresswoman Comstock and Congresswoman Maloney have introduced uh, more family-friendly leave policies. So that seems to be an area of hope in this current Congress. I wonder what you all thought about that and the potential for that being a way forward for more bipartisanship. Oh, I think you're, you're right. It would be way forward for uh, bipartisanship, and Ivanka is the favorite child, <laughs> so <laughs> so I'm very I'm very for Ivanka to keep pushing it with her father because we know he can move. Mm -hmm. So no, uh, you know it's very important to have somebody like that ch uh, championing an issue, and uh, uh, daycare is so important. Mm -hmm. You know we're the only uh, Western uh, country like ourselves that doesn't have a daycare, automatic daycare program, and poor grandmothers. I mean, it used to be you like to see the children, but now they have the children. I mean, it's, just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, just, it's tough, but no, I think that's a good suggestion. Mm -hmm. Very good. Anybody who knows Ivanka, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> I love Ivanka. Mm -hmm. she, is, she and I are contemporaries. And she is not afraid to be a businesswoman. She's not afraid to be a wife. She's not afraid to be a mom. She talks about those three things with such eloquence and strength that is really hard to balance. Mm -hmm. um, she definitely has, she has tried to reach out to the Hill to talk about the issues. And I think that there is a lot of hope there. Mm -hmm. And the conversation is shifting. I will say the um, parent staffs on the Hill, there's a house daycare that is a three-year waiting list. So if you are a staffer and you are thinking about ever having children, you pay the $75 and get yourself on the wait list. <laughs> <laughs> if you are a member, you have to rely on your staff to say, hey, if you are ever thinking of having kids, put yourself on the wait list. <laughs> Members do not have priority, and this also touches on the first question that was asked. Um, the daycare is tiny. So we have looked, I don't know if everyone remembers, but the PAGE program was stopped on the house side and that building has turned into a storage room. So now the parents on the Hill and the members on the Hill who do have kids have been pushing to turn the PAGE dorm into a much larger daycare facility. And it's those kinds of things that really do make a difference even culturally on the Hill to be having this conversation is a really big deal. Thank you. Hi, thank you for being here tonight. Um, my question kind of has to do with the way that media often frames um, both women leaders and women who are running for, politi uh, for political office. And I was wondering if you might be able to speak a little bit to um, ways that we think about either changing the narrative uh, for people who aren't in the media or as um, leaders in your field um, in, you know, kind of just changing the way that we talk about um, women's leadership kind of in general. Maybe you should answer that question. Yeah. I will <laughs> listen and take notes. <laughs> well, I, I, it, it struck me that with Hillary Clinton, there was so much media coverage on what she wore, mm -hmm. the pant, pantsuits and uh, that... Uh, the commentary on her hairdo and the commentary on her weight. Uh, I, I never heard or read or saw anything about any of the male, I mean, Bernie Sanders, you know, looked like he just got out of bed. Nobody ever said, <laughs> look at that rumpled suit. Did, didn't he wear that tie yesterday, it right? You know, that, or, 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 and certainly not with, with any of the, the males on the Republican side. So, Although Donald Trump's hair was a, a the, the, great yeah, source that's, of Well, how could you not? I mean, really, really, come on. You know, that, uh, I think he invited that. No, but, but the point being that women are talked about in those kinds of terms as a 
a product on the shelf. You know, it, it's, you just look at the product and what's the packaging and what does it look like. And uh, so I am not in the media, so uh, I, I know how I rail against that, but I don't know actually how to solve it. So maybe, Rebecca, you have some suggestions here for your colleagues. Well, I would concede that I'm not a fan uh, by any means of that sort of coverage. Sure. And I think, um, frankly, maybe it's a question of getting more women as political reporters because there it's a very um, testosterone-driven industry point. in the same way that sometimes politics can be. Um, just like sports reporting attracts many male reporters, politics can do the same. Um, and so I think if you have more women who are reporting on politics and government, we wouldn't think of raising those issues. We would frame it as more of a policy debate. I think that I think Great that's suggestion. So. Thank you. So if people don't want to go into politics, go into yeah. journalism. <laughs> Thank you in journalism. <laughs> there are no other questions. Let me check the time. I think we do have time for a couple more questions. If anyone wants to, all right. Yeah, that gentleman here. All right, she won. <laughs> you can take the first <laughs> one. To the mic. Oh, hello. Thank you for speaking tonight. Uh, my question is one that my friends and I have spent a lot of time thinking about and talking about, but we haven't really arrived at a conclusion. And one situation, well, it could, the situation could be found in different, different scenarios, but given two candidates for a job or two candidates running for office, one's male, one's female, is merit more important? Or if there's a qualified man and a nearly as qualified woman, should the nearly as qualified woman get the job or be elected over the man who's maybe a little bit more qualified or not? I'm not obviously saying that men are more qualified, but just it's an example. Um, because since it does seem to be so important to close, to achieve a balance in representation between male and female, I don't know, points of view, inside <laughs> people. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I wish that? we had that problem more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's, uh, I, I think once you get a male and a female going against each other, people are looking at for the same thing they'd look if it was two men or two women against each other. Uh, your, your constituency gets to know you very well when you're running. And they look to all different types of things. But uh, I think when the votes go in, uh, it's, a, it's a number of things. It's not just one or two things they're judging you on. It's the whole package. And uh, who they think would make the best representative. If we get these women to run, I don't think they're going to have the problem. Uh, it's getting to run. Well, so given, can I follow up really quickly? I don't want to take this. Um, given, so do we have a, do we have a duty to vote or hire people based on their merit, or should we also because, oftentimes there's a problem with there's, you know, for forever been a problem with sexism and picking men over women, thinking they're more qualified. So is it hip? Is it hypocritical to hire a woman because she's a woman over a man applying for the same job or running for the same position? But the question is, what, it, what constitutes merit? What constitu Is it that uh, he's a Harvard MBA and she's been a stay-at-home mom? Her life experience it could be far more valuable than an ivory tower experience in representing a constituency of uh, Blue collar, working class people. So it, it, it's much more nuanced than than you're positing. It's, it's not just oh that she's a, a, a woman and is less meritorious because she maybe doesn't have certain uh, business experience or degrees or what have you, but she has a life experience that could be even more. You use your words meritorious, and the the issue of. Um, should we appoint a woman? Look, I'm, I'm the product of affirmative action, and I know it. You know, my, my first job as a lawyer, when I w first started out, when I graduated law school, every single major law office in San Diego, every law firm said, we don't hire girls, right? 
So what did the girls have to do? We had to either uh, hang out our own shingle, uh, get together and, and open a small office, or go to work for government because government was then opening up for women lawyers. Uh, the, my, my next job, clearly it was they were looking for a woman. And you know what? I took the, the job and I showed them what a woman could do. And the very next person that was hired was a woman. So uh, yeah, you know, you, sometimes uh, life is unfair, but it also breaks your way. Take advantage of it and do your best in that position. There's another answer to, uh, to this whole situation. If you look at a list of countries and how many uh, women are in the represented, uh, represented in the bodies of government, uh, we're way down the bottom. I believe Ireland and Japan are the only ones underneath us as, as far as percentage of, of women go. But you have to remember, in many of these countries, they have uh, 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 they they set aside so many seats for women. That, you know, they they have to be represented by so many women. And I, I never wanted to do that. I, you know, I, I just don't think that's a good idea. But I'm beginning to think if we don't get more women to run, I'll be for that. <laughs> It's to, sounding better and better. To Barbara's point, though, that's I was thinking as you were asking your question uh, and Lynn was answering, uh, being on the other side, I wouldn't want someone to vote for me because I was a woman. I'd want them to vote for me because they thought I could do the best job. And so th that's just the other side of it. I wouldn't want to be hired because I was a woman. I, w I would like them to, to hire me because they thought I could do the job best. And so that's just from my, my side of things, you know, from the from being the hiree or the elected official. It's also hard to succeed if you and everyone in your organization believes that you are there just because you're a woman. I mean, it really depends on the scenario. It can turn out really well, but it can also turn out really poorly. Um, I mean, I have seen it, and it will cause people to question why you're there or just not take you seriously. And you'll just be sure you're at the table, but that's it, you're just at the table. You're not a part of the real conversation that's going well, on. Well, that's true if you are just at the table and you don't assert yourself and show right. what you can do. And I'll tell you, I will take any vote that I could get because I won by a very slim margin. <laughs> so if people voted for me because I'm a woman, great. You know, I'll, I'll take it and I'll show you what I can do. So uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't want them to say, I'm not voting for you because you are a woman. Yeah, that's. But the problem with when you think, I, mean, I don't say in your situation, but is that sexism? Is there some element of sexism in that? Of course that, there is. You know, that we're saying, okay, I'm going to vote for this person because, gosh, you know, he's a good-looking guy or, or she's, you know. And so that, that therein lies the but dilemma that's and the right. tension. I mean, I think, you, you know, that really does happen. And, and yes, about the good-looking men, too. You know? <laughs> yeah. And then there's, of course, the question of how does critical mass for women in a legislating body, for example, change just generally how the whole body functions? And that could also be part of the consideration. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question over here, um, as long as we don't go too long. So please, um, somebody referred earlier to the significant amount of support that Donald Trump received from women. I just wonder whether you had a perspective on why you think that was. I'm, I'm thinking, obviously, of the his comments during the campaign about women and the open mic comments. Um, I suppose I understand why people don't necessarily vote on gender lines, and I understand why a woman might vote Democrat or she might vote Republican. I can't quite get my head around why a woman would vote for that particular individual, and I wondered if you had a, an Neither insight. Neither can I, on why so that I was. have nothing to say. <laughs> <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> we might have to turn to the Republicans on this panel <laughs> for this question. You're on. We'll provide the guidance. I was really offended when people would literally, how can you not vote for Hillary? She's a woman. I'm like, what does that even mean? What are you talking about? And with Trump, no, I did not like the comments. Was that the first time that I've ever heard a man say that? No, it wasn't. Let's just put it out there. Um, so when it came down to it, for me, it really was about policy. It was about where I want the country to go. It did not come down to a comment that he made to a friend when he thought no one was listening. And I'm not condoning it in any way, but I, I still am just fundamentally bothered by 
voting for or against someone because of their gender. And I'll just say that I started out in, during the primary with all of those choices on the Republican side. I was on Carly Fiorina's state leadership board, and that's where I began uh, to, to, to get involved with the presidency. And I, I did a, a Congress to Campus program over in Jordan, and we were over there, and we spent a whole week, myself and Dave Skaggs, and at the time it was through the primary process, and it was, they, they kept saying, do you think Trump will get elected? And he and I were, no way, no way. <laughs> I need to go back there and kind of restore my <laughs> credibility. And uh, because it was just beyond the realm of possibility. But the American people, and I'm from New York, and, and Lynn talked about California, but a lot of people in between said, we're tired of the Washington bubble, we're tired of status quo, and we want somebody who didn't spend his whole life not just Hillary, but on the Republican side as well, grooming themselves for this moment. We want somebody who comes in from the outside who's going to change it up down there. And he has done that, and then some. <laughs> but um, that's what the American people were, were really, that was a lot of what the election was about. It was like, we got to break up that monopoly down there, that, that group down there, that they just kind of go along and they don't really get anything done. We yeah. want something different. And that was, I think, what happened. I think we need to wish Emily a happy birthday. Yes. This is her 13th birthday today. <laughs> Very good. Very good. We have some future women leaders here exactly. in the front row. Um, exactly. But that's a great place to end. Right back where we started talking about this election. Let's never speak of this again. We've talked about it way too much. <laughs> Thank you all for coming tonight, for listening to this conversation. There's so much more we can talk about with women in politics and government, but I hope you all will continue this important discussion amongst yourselves and your communities um, or just thinking about it yourselves. But, um, and as these wonderful women urged you, think about getting involved. It's very important. Or in journalism, that's fine too. Um, and thank you to our great panel. Let's give them a round of applause. And yes. thank you to the National Archives for hosting us all together. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.